It's 12.30, time to start our meeting if everyone will get seated. Elaine is going to introduce our program today. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, now, I can't step up on that podium without falling off. We have one of our own members as a speaker today. Jamie Wilkerson, would you please come forward? She's going to speak to us on sustainable da -da 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 gardening. <laughs> Y'all can hear me. All right. Sustainable gardening is pretty much like permaculture, and I know everybody's familiar with that. So I'm just going to try to stick with everything I wrote down because if you've ever listened to me, I go down rabbit holes. So <laughs> I'll be short and sweet for all of us. So, all right. First thing in sustainable garden is choosing your location in your yard. Like when, you, when I say location, I mean somewhere when you're planting, you want it to get the most sunlight possible if you're planting sun, and you want to get the best shade if you're planting shade plants. The, what I have here is if you're doing your vegetable garden or sun-loving perennials, you want to plant it from north to south, which is the one over here. And the reason why, when the sun comes up, you want the rows going this way, so it gets both sides, the top, and the other side as it goes down because if you plant it from the east to west which is the other one it's not really it's blocking out if you have taller stuff on one side it's going to block it out and the other stuff is not going to grow it will not get the sufficient 8 to 12 hour sunlight that it requires so i know in some places it's hard to do that i, I live on the side of the mountain so it's kind of hard for us and i had to get out and figure it out because of the trees and everything but I have noticed that one of my gardens is east to west just because I didn't have a choice. And the plants still grow, but I have noticed a significant decrease in size on the ones on that east side. And so that's how, when you're doing sustainable garden, you're looking for whatever is easiest for it to grow on its own. That way it's not hard on you. So, who wants to spend all day out in the garden, right? I do. <laughs> so, but, um, so yeah, you're choosing a location that works with you and not against you. And like I said, you're also looking for water drainage as far as that. You want your water to drain down your rows. That way it's covering both sides of it and filling those roots in. This is loud up here. So, yeah, location is usually the best thing. And like I said, with your shade plants, they can sustain a little bit of sun. We all know that. Um, so, but you want it to where it gets usually the morning time sun, that way the dew is drying off and you don't have to worry about stuff being susceptible to disease. And sustainable garden, it, to me, is just making it easier on yourself. So if you have a large area, you need it to be easy to maintain and you want it to produce more. And with saying choosing your location, once you get your location, building your soil health is the main thing. Because nothing's going to grow unless you have a really good soil. And like you can take the soil sample down to the office and get it checked, to check your pH and everything. Um, I, I'm first hand, I actually am going to bring a soil sample because I bought, purchased some garden mix from somewhere and nothing's growing in it this year. And it's my fault because I didn't keep up with composting. And with composting, it's just using all of the matter from your garden, uh, any, when you cut down plants, don't put disease plants into your compost because it has a tendency it will carry on once it composes as something diseases and bacteria. It's like um, the mosaic and everything on your tomato plants. Take those over and burn it to get that out. And I've just added pictures of different ways to compost and there's still other ways of doing it. I know there's a big barrel on a turn thing that you can turn and it's supposed to speed it up. I have the one on this side and you just turn it over. I got, you put the pallet system and you just flip it. 
um, yard. Um, you want anything out of your kitchen scraps, so therefore you're using everything that you're using is benefiting yourself because you're not having as much waste because you're using it that. So just take all your garden waste, sticks, limbs, everything will decompose in time. I'm not an expert on composting. I know you have a hot compost and a cold compost and everything. I just do what's easy for me because I'm busy all the time. So the three-step method, like the one in the middle on the left, would be my favorite one because you're just flipping it over. But saying with the composting, you want to build your soil up that way. Your plants have a better chance of growing because they're getting the optimum nutrients and everything. And you still need to fertilize and make it that way. But with self-sustainability, you're using all your resources. So composting is another way to use your resources. Rainwater. I know they just had a thing at the greenhouse on rainwater and everything. And this is a perfect way of being sustainable. Because that sustainable is also cutting down your cost. And that water can get expensive during the summer when you're having to water two to three times a day. And especially if you're in that full sun, you're wanting to have those roots moist and so they don't get burnt. And this is just some ways that I've seen people, I've seen the big food grade, big plastic things up on stilts people use. The blue rain barrel there on the left, that's like the one they did at the detention center. And you can decorate them and make them pretty. That way there's not just one big blue barrel in your yard. I've seen the trash can rain barrels used before. I was actually in New Orleans uh, this earlier this month in a walk in the neighborhood, and I, there were several trash cans used down there where they had made rain barrel rain catches. And you put the mesh on it and everything. So part of that, being part of the sustainable living, is you're cutting down your cost. And plus, the nitrogen that's in the water is also beneficial to your plants. So... I'm going to try to stick to everything I'm talking about. All right. Oh, it went the wrong way. There we go. All right. This is succession and companion planting. When you're doing sustainable garden, you want to cut, back, to cut down on weeding and watering and everything because that's the whole point of saving, watering, and everything. So when you do succession planting, that's making sure that you're planting things in, let's say, beans. That's all we all know, how fast they grow. Well, you can plant them three to four weeks later, you can plant another succession of them. And three to four weeks later, plant another succession of them. That is giving you enough harvest time throughout the year to make sure that you have enough. And you can do the same with squash and zucchini because the squash borer is really bad in the springtime. And well, that and mildew. If everybody notices, you get squash bugs and mildew during the spring. If you hold off and wait till in July to plant your squash and zucchini, you have a little bit better growing time because of it. So, and companion planting, that's also planting with like marigolds, calendula. Um, I added some pictures, these are not my garden. This is some I found online. But you got your kale and your brassicas and stuff. That's going to be another part of your succession and your three season growing, which I talk about that. When you're sustainable growing, you want to do three seasons all in one season or three plantings all in one season. So for, when I got this, it's just, you, it says to plant densely to cut back on your weeds and plant companion plants to cut back on pests. Also, dense planting helps shade your roots to minimize the drying of the soil, which goes back to saving your water. And this is types of mulch. When we were talking about composting, a lot of people will put your compost down and forget to cover it up. Your mulch is there to help keep your soil cool and moist. And there's different options. You're not limited to just going and buying what they have at the store. You can use what you have on hand. Some people have pine trees in your yard, and pine mulch is a really good option for that. You can use straw. Hay, the only thing with using some of the hay is they have seeds, and when it gets wet, you'll have little green grass pop up, which are easy to pull out. But, and then we have different kinds of mulch. You got your big bulk, which is when you go to the compost facility here in town, a lot of it's big chunks besides the leaf mulch. Um, I know a lot of people use gravel, 
to, around some plants, especially shrubs and everything. And that's just going to, when you water, it's going to keep that ground cool and keep it moist a little bit longer. Now the shade cloth, the plastic stuff, I don't use it, but I know a lot of people that do large farms use it because it's just not sufficient enough for them to go out and weed and hoe and everything. So that kind of mulching helps with them. So when you're mulching, just keep in mind that that is part of your soil health and will cut down on your time in the garden as far as watering and weeding and everything. So mulching is really important, but also when you go in there and plant densely and you plant, I know a lot of people is used to a square foot garden and you read, plant so many plants, I don't ever listen to that. I have them planted. If there's a spot open, something's going in there. <laughs> We're not going to expose it any soil. I mean, my husband's constantly like, oh my gosh, you have a jungle. I do, but I'm not out there weeding it as much as everybody else because everybody else wants the mulch and everything, and they're out there with the Bermuda grass and everything like that. I'm not. Mine's plants. I mean, I have them sprawling out the side. They're sticking up. I, I plant it together. And with the companion planting, well, I accidentally hit it. Um, I'll go back to that, but lawns and gardens, that's kind of where I was going at, but everybody is, to make it sustainable and for you, it takes a lot of water and resources to mow your yards. You might have to hire a maintenance person to come out, you might, you know, you're fertilizing it, you're out there making sure it's good. So another way of sustainable garden is to decrease your lawn size, and I'm not saying to get rid of all your lawns, because I still have little, little patches of lawn, because it's nice to be able to walk out on your yard. But this is ways that in some towns and stuff that they're going and they're using permaculture. And this is, you know, the yard started out as the grass and they pulled it back to the topsoil. And they've added the gravel that's in, in their walking paths and stuff. So that's, and you can see they're densely planting stuff too. I mean, it's packed in there. And that's just an example of an urban permaculture farm. Like, there's several, um, I think it's a website called, it's a YouTube page called Epic Gardening. That's pretty much what his backyard and his front yard is. It's his whole garden. His rain catching system's there, his compost system. That way everything is at hand. I remember when I first started, well, I've been gardening all my life with my grandparents, but when I had my own, somebody told me I was just struggling with stuff because I lived on 24 acres and I put the garden way behind the shop back there. It's hard to make yourself get up and go out there. <laughs> like, you're like, you know it's there, you want to do it, but it's just going out there. And, to make gardening work for you, put it near your door. Put it close to you. Put it, you know, containers on your patio if you don't have a big spot. Make it easily accessible to you. That way it's sustainable because you're out there, you've put the time and effort in to plant these plants and you've watered them. Make it to where you're harvesting them. You're not going to forget about them out there. Make it easy on you. Like when you walk out your porch, I plant herbs and I plant vegetables in my flower beds beside my house. I have a tomato plant right now that's about to outdo my hydrangea. So, I mean, I'm constantly planting stuff where it's accessible to me and making it to where I'm happy to walk out there. Because once I see that, I'll follow the path and go down there to all the other gardens because I'm excited to see what it is. So, this is, I'm excited to see a lot of cities and towns converting over to permaculture and doing yards. I know some zoning won't allow it, but that's, I just wanted to give everybody an example of that for a sustainable garden. That way you're sustaining your water, you're not watering a yard, you're not fertilizing, and all that. And this is what I was talking about earlier, about your three plantings in a season, the succession planting. I got ahead of myself a while ago. Back to school, so. And I added the center one there because I know a lot of people do container planting, and I do, I live on the side of the mountain, so I do a lot of container planting or raised beds. And you can still do your succession planting in there. You just pull up the different things. Like that tomato plant would have suckers on it. You, in the, in the, like, the armpit of the tomato, you just pull that little sucker off, put it in water, and it roots within three or four days. You can put it in there. And so you have another tomato, the same one that you started out with, to replant that one when it starts either getting sickly or dry or anything like that. Uh, and then your companion plants, you can leave those in but you're constantly wanting to succession plant with different things. You have, I think there's brassicas and stuff in there. It's getting too hot for that, they're gonna bolt. So you would go back and plant that with some sun, sun loving stuff, as your tomatoes and your peppers. And there is actually some beets out there that like um, heat. So I do have some from Texas A&M that they did type. So I will still grow those. 
but also with your perennials, they'll die back. If you have com perennial companion plants, you want to also add some annuals in there. That way when your perennials start dying back, you'll also still have a pest deter deterrent in there. So I was just giving examples. This was part of that house that I showed y'all a while ago where they converted their yard. And you can see their use of the bulk, bark mulch and the gravel and the densely compacting in a succession plant and they have their garlic right right now it's time to pull your garlic if you haven't and get it up and then give your ground fertilize it do whatever you want to put the compost make sure never let your soil dry out because it comes hydrophobic and you cannot once you it takes forever to get it replenished i know a lot of people will pull up all their plants and go i'm done until the fall keep out there and mulching and watering your soil because you're going to have more problems more pests if you let it dry out if those first one to two inches of your soil ever gets hydrophobic, it's hard to make it wet again. If you've ever noticed when you fill up a plant, how it floats to the top because you don't let it get so dry and it finally has to soak in, that's how your yard does. So even if you're not planting in something, try to keep something on the soil. Like I said, keep your mulch on top of it, whether it's cedar mulch or hay or whatever. And this is to get away from gardening, because I know not everybody has big gardens. This is your perennial beds, and using the no fuss garden plans is pretty much, you're compacting all the perennials into that spot so they can fill up that area so you're not out there weeding the garden. And it's not gonna take as much water to keep them watered. Usually with something like this, I would stretch a soaker hose out there and it would probably you turn it on once a day or once every two days because it is so lush and shade it. It's not going to dry out as fast. And with perennials, you're taking that space, they're growing, and you can multiply. And you can take it, you can move it to another spot to enlarge that area, you can share the plants, do whatever, but you're taking that sustainability to your flowers. So it's only costing you one time to buy that plant, and you're going to keep producing more and filling up areas. Now, with those, it's also got pollinator plants because even with perennials, just like vegetables, you need pollinators. And I always make sure there's a water source in there for them. And make sure sometimes I put beads of gravel and stuff in there for your bees and stuff. That way you're not using as much water. And some good perennials, like the no-fuss garden, you want stuff that's going to grow out in the heat. Um, I know a lot of phlox is in bloom right now, your Rebecca, um, your coneflowers, the Autumn Joy Sedum. All of that just multiplies so fast that you will have a really pretty area in no time and you won't be out there weeding it and constantly watering it. I mean, if, you got to be patient with it and that's the biggest virtue with all of us, I know. I'm a, when I plant it, I want to see something immediately. So, <laughs> and, but if you plant it and over time it's going to grow and it's going to cut down, you might seem like a lot of work at first, but eventually it'll pay, pay off. And this is just something I put on there to show where the gardener had used. He had the compost in at one end. He's got the rain barrels out there. The trellising is densely planted in your compost. And for the center of the rows, they use some kind of mulch. So they're constantly being able to reuse stuff all in one area to make it easy on them. And it wouldn't be sustainable if you didn't have plants that kept all the bugs away. <laughs> The bugs are the biggest thing when you go out. You don't want to go out there because you're going to get mosquitoes. You're going to get all that. So I put a little list of some of the things you can plant around your yard that also helps keep the pests away, the mosquitoes and the ticks and stuff. I know rosemary is supposed to be really good for ticks too, I heard. So I bought a bunch this year and planted it everywhere, and I've been propagating some in my little greenhouse. So that's pretty much, when I say sustainable, I mean, you can take in, you can take it to a whole new level. You can go with your solar panels and it will run your timers on your water. I mean, there's so many different things that you can do. When you're picking your plants, uh, native plants are always the best choice because they're going to not require as much water. They're not going to require as much uh, deadheading and everything. So when you're planting certain things, a native is the best way to go. And don't plant invasive stuff because then you're going to be cutting down your time because you're going to be cutting your time to keep it from going where you want it to go. So that's going to take away from other things. So that's pretty much when it comes to sustainability. It's really not that hard. It's just using what you have and making it work. So 
it can be a really pretty garden and you can still have everything. It can be a garden that you like, junk in it and reuse your junk, plastic jugs. I mean, there's so much stuff that you can reuse. It, so, yeah, so I'm glad I got to speak and there y'all go. the bark on the ends, stick it in rooting hormone, and I have a mixture of like peat moss and sand, and I just stick it in there just to make sure it stays moist. Sometimes I'll put a Ziploc bag over the top of it just to create that greenhouse dome effect, and it keeps the humidity into it. How long does it take for it to root? It does not take long at all for it. Now, it won't actually grow. You know, next year you'll have a little bit bigger of a plant, but it's not going to get big till the third year. But yeah, it's pretty much easily. Any kind of uh, perennial that you have that has a woody base to it, just scratch you know, the surface of it and dip it in that rooting hormone and keep it in some moist soil. And sand does really good when you're doing propagation because it stays moist. So, any more questions? If you stratify seeds yes. and you forget them back up them in the refrigerator, I still have them come up after I've left them in there for two years before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I left some poppies in there one year and I was like, well, they're not coming up. Through them out, they did come up. And I have left actually some daylily seeds in there. I had a lady that high rises them, give me some, stuck them in the refrigerator, forgot about them. The next year they came up just fine. So I'm sure there's some seeds that won't, but most of them still come up. So, thank y'all for having me. Thank you, Gail. The minutes were published in the newsletter. Are there any additions or corrections? Then they will be published as written. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer Denise Steinhaus. Hey, y'all. We, um, I think we sent those reports out also, so if you had a chance to look at them, does anyone have any questions? That's what I like. So, um, we have, uh, uh, at the end of this, I'm going to tell you about the plant sale, but we have now deposited all the plant sale monies and pretty much expensed all the plant sale and garden show things. So, anyway, so the cash report shows uh, how our money went out. So, you might want to look at that and some, how some money came in. And look at that. But the balance in our account is $52,091.49. And I forgot my glasses. Hope I read that right. Okay. And then we have the income and expense report. And of course, that shows more or less where the, <laughs> where the money comes out of and where it goes into. And so you might want to look at that. And the last thing is I wanted to let you know how the Plant Cell and Garden Show turned out. So the income on that was uh, $45,626, wow. And the expenses totaled $9,914.06. So the net income from the plant sale and garden show is $35,711.94. See, everybody is in awe. And Diane's going, yes, that means lots of money for a scholarship. I, heard, I saw that just like, it just came out of your mouth, out of your head. Woo. Okay, so thank you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, second Vice President Lynn Johnson, membership. Okay, I'm glad to announce that we have 98 members here. 
and we also have four guests. Uh, they're at, some of them are out of state. Robin Walters is from Virginia. If you'll stand up. Uh, Nancy is is here with Joel and Jane Lip Liberty is, is from uh, Alabama and Rhonda Hughes, I think that was Pepper's mother, right? No? I'm here with Ramona. Ramona, oh, Ramona's friend, okay, thank you. We uh, have the board outside that stopped on June the 3rd, but today, June the 20th, we have 169 members that have reported hours. So we got a few to go here. <laughs> we have had 11,714 sanctioned hours, 577 non-sanctioned hours, so that makes a total of 12,000. 291 total work hours, and we have 3,221 education hours. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Okay, Elaine Sichter with Project Guidance. Hi, guys. Again, I am trying to start meeting with all the different committees. And I put out an invitation for all the garden uh, greenhouses, detention center, garden center, everything that's relating to growing our plants for us to get together. I have not heard from some, but I am going to go next week at 8.30 in the morning <laughs> to the detention learning center and see what they're doing with the students, watch a class visit with, with their, where they've got the Arkansas Diamond Trails, and Linda and Marty are going to escort me. So I'm going to try to keep meeting with different groupings of committees. Hopefully we'll just do lunch, since I can't make it to every committee meeting. So that's an update for now. And everybody did send in their project evaluations. I think the biggest question about that is why is everybody asking for more money? <laughs> <laughs> well, that will be discussed, I'm sure, at the board meeting uh, in July. So we'll make sure make sure that your chair or co-chair or someone from your committee is present at the July board meeting. Okay, uh, mentors, first year master gardeners, and CART, the evaluation, Sherry Davis. All right, let me start with CART. Uh, we have begun that process. We only have two projects to um, evaluate this year, and uh, both of them happen to be chaired by James Moore, so I've, we've started the process with James, and we'll, in fact, I see him back there. I hadn't seen him before. I want to ask you a question after the meeting. Uh, anyway, we're getting that started finally. So uh, the next thing is the first years. I have about a dozen who have now completed all their hours. They are fully certified. I would like for them to come up and I'll give them their little busy bee pins. So, Carla Arthur, uh, Trevor Crandall, Bill Creasy, nobody's here, uh, Amber Grace, Blaze? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Come on up, Amber. Uh, Reggie Gloyston. Uh, Karen Griffin. Karen, I think you. Yeah, Karen Griffin, wasn't she here? Okay, there she is. Uh, Shelly Hill. Uh, Nancy Nuts. Son? <laughs> no, I never know how to say her name. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you offline how to say your name. Uh, Mary Kay. Same thing. Old Nick, I think. Yeah, she's here. Pepper Smith. Pepper Smith. And Linda Smoke. All right. Congratulations and welcome to my Okay, 
okay, while FT is getting the photo, let's have our county agent report. Aaron? Hey everyone, how's everyone doing today? Good. Good. There we go, everyone's awake at least, so that's good. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to mention is, these are the new Master Gardener books. These were the ones that all the new Master Gardeners got through training. It's no longer with the little binder. You can come up and take a look at them. All of these are for sale. It's just to get our money back on them. They're $50. Um, the office takes cash or check. And then if anyone wants any, I can make a list. And then I can order more, some more from Randy. They're pretty nice. They have a bunch of information in. So I think they're pretty useful. I just wanted to thank everyone for their hard work with the plant sale of the convention. It's pretty fun to do that for the first year. So we got to keep it going now. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me make a comment about that book. I know when I finished my Master Gardener training, I had a huge binder. I'd even put extra files into it, and it was huge. And where do you put something like that? It went in a cabinet, and I don't think I've looked at it since I finished Master Gardening. It's not easy to find things in it. Guess what? All of that material is now condensed into an actual book with an index at the back where you can look up things when you need to reference something. So I'm going to be first in line to buy one. Thank you, Erin, for making these available to us. Okay, unfinished business, uh, annual evaluation. Sherry, do you want to say anything about that? Just real quickly, um, the evaluations went out. As you notice, they were very short this year. Um, if you did not open yours the first time around, you received a second one already. We would love to have those returned or completed by the end of this month, and then we'll tabulate everything and get back with you on the results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, state conference wrap up. Tricia and Paula. Paula. <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all, we did it. We put on a kick ass convention. <laughs> So I wanted to thank everyone who participated, um, especially the people that uh, brought homemade goodies to the hospitality. And Kathy Searcy has brought back the ones that we didn't eat. They've been frozen, so they're not stale. <laughs> and then there's also some um, snacks from Wicked. Is that it? So just go over there and grab it. Um, 500 people registered, so we had a full registration. About 50 didn't come for whatever reason. Part of it was tornado damage in northwest Arkansas. But, um, you know, our garden tours, our uh, pre-conference tour, everything was pretty much full. And um, we didn't hear anything except complimentary. Uh, remarks. Okay, just a little thing that irritates me. Um, I greeted this guy coming off the bus from the tour and he did the lake tour. And I happened to be on that. So he said, oh, is that your yard? I said, yes. He says, it's lovely, yes. But boy, that 67 Camaro is neat. <laughs> Going seriously? <laughs> so um, it really was good. Uh, the vendors were fantastic. Uh, and heads up to Claudette because at the very last moment, a couple vendors had to not come. And so she scoured the area and she got country gardens. They were great. Yes. And, um, but yeah. Claudette had to do some promising on that. <laughs> um, but you know, one of the hiccups was 
the lovely centerpieces that was going to be over for the tables that's going to overflow with these beautiful petunias. <laughs> well, the petunias didn't do so well. And then, hey, let's have a big storm. And um, so the petunias didn't make it. But the city greenhouse went through all of their stuff, and they made 60 um, lovely centerpieces. Plus they loaned us, what, six or seven big ferns. So, you know, heads up to them and heads up to the decorating committee because they had three areas to take pictures, and people were just ooing and eyeing over that. Um, oh yeah, and the bus for the Hot Springs Village tour in the morning <laughs> broke down. So um, we regrouped. Yeah, we took care of it. And yeah, it all we worked. Out. Put, put them on the seats for the second tour. We said, "Come on, come on!" And That's one right. One village, right. Come on. Yeah. So um, that was pretty much it. We oh, and the breakout speakers were fantastic, mm -hmm. yeah. and the keynote speakers were excellent, yes. and. Um, we were told that on Saturday morning, okay, we're going to have Janet Carson and Felder Russian speak. But don't expect very many people Saturday morning because they're all going home. Well, we had almost a full um, group of people, and I think that's because of the quality of the speakers. So, thank you, Gail. And I know Marty helped, you know, with the speakers also. And, oh, and the hotel was excited. They had 476 check-ins, and that's for three days, you know, like they count me three days. So, anyway, that's about 150 rooms per day, which is excellent, and they were really excited. I guess that's about it. Any questions? Hospitality. <laughs> yes, they did, and um, I talked to you about the food, but it was nice to be able to just go and sit. I, and, um, oh yeah, and a steel tumbler was left in the war room. Is anybody missing a steel tumbler? It disappeared. It disappeared. Oh. So, somebody got it. Somebody, somebody got it. Great. Oh, oh and um, here comes Rebecca about t-shirts. want to thank Donna Woodard. She kind of kept us straight <laughs> about who belongs where. So thank you, Donna. There's Char back there. Yes, Char. So there are approximately 14 welcome bags that we have left over and six
Okay, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Tricia and Paula. Thank you for a wonderful time. So, I think we ought to do this again in another 17 years. <laughs> garden tours that happened at, right after state conference. Carolyn? Hi everybody. First of all, I would like to thank our homeowners that opened their yards again Sunday for our tour. Appreciate everyone that did it. We had great tours. Just as a matter for our new master gardeners, usually we have our garden tour in May for the master gardeners, and because of state convention. There was no way we were going to tackle two tours on the same time, but uh, it worked out that y'all got to see them. I did talk to some of the homeowners, and they were thrilled. I think we, the basic, I think, was between 20 and 25 visitors at most of the yards, and I had one that they had close to 50 visitors. So we had a great turnout, and I hope y'all enjoyed it. Okay, on to new business. Uh, Char Becker has a couple of things to say about the fair. Okay, so it seems like it's rather early for the county fair, but it's not. Um, the county fair is coming up in September. Obviously, that's when it normally is. We'll send up a more detailed um, communication about dates and needs. Um, again, uh, Donna, thank goodness, is going to help us with Sign Up Genius for volunteers. Um, for those of you who signed up on the uh, with Sherry Davis when we did the boards, we have those names. But if you're interested, if you don't remember if you signed up or not, please send me an email, like don't walk up to me after the meeting and say, I'd like to help, I'd like to help, because I'll never remember. Um, so that would be great. We don't have our theme yet. We'll figure that out at our first meeting in early July. Um, just so you know, there have been a couple of activities already going on. Um, for those of you who attended last year's fair, participation from the youth was not great. So we met with the 4-H um, extension agent and had um, a potting party with nine or ten little children in March. And chairs for various committees. And one of the things that has been suggested is an opportunity to shadow, uh, to see something about what the various officers do. One thing that we do as officers is we meet once a month at the first of the month to try to plan the agenda for the coming meeting and to take care of the, a lot of the business so that when you come to a meeting, we can keep it short. It doesn't drag on. We would like to extend an invitation to any of you who think you might like to become an officer this year, next year, whenever. If you have an interest and think that at some point you might like to be an officer, we would love to have you join us at the July executive meeting. The executive meeting is held July 1st at 1 o'clock at the library. And it'll be an open meeting. We'll go through the normal activities so, so you can see how it all runs. But I hope some of you will join us. We're going to send this invitation out 
in constant contact as well, but I wanted to give you a heads up on why we were doing it and the fact that we would love to have you come and see what being an officer involves. Okay, second, third item of business. We have some news about the sew and tail table that I think is really, really wonderful. And I'd like for Karen to come up and tell you a little bit about it. Hey, y'all. I hope everybody got a chance to walk over to the sewing till table to see what one of our committee members, June Ann, uh, put together. It's a uh, literature and flowers in the garden, in, uh, or vice versa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's it's really beautiful, and a lot of work uh, goes into those uh, each month. And uh, what? is new is that uh, the work goes into it, it's up for an hour, and then it gets packed away. So we thought maybe we could uh, use, it, use it at other places, and we have a, we're going to have a table starting today um, at the library, and we're going to set up so until there. Uh, we're going to try, try and track how many people stop by and uh, with us asking them to sign. Um, also, we're going to um, have the brochures to become a master gardener uh, there, and hopefully this will uh, promote our organization and extend the education that the Sew and Till table presents. Good. Yeah. I think we need a huge thank you, give, to give a huge thank you to Karen and her committee because this is really a wonderful publicity avenue for our group. And you're right, you, you put a huge amount of work into these and it's good to have other people see it besides just those who happen to be at the meeting. Okay, we are through with Oh, unfinished and new business uh, announcements. Is there a drawing today? Yes. Oh, okay, let's, let's get on with our drawing. And while you're getting that set up, Diane had an announcement that she wanted to make. So while they're getting that together, Diane, come on up. Hello everybody, I just want to remind everybody that next month's meeting will be the scholarship winners. We have four winners and I talked to June Ann at Hospitality and she's going to have some little goodies up front. So I'm inviting everyone to come up, meet the winners, of course we're going to have a speaker and do things, but meet him, congratulate him, tell him how good they are. We have excellent people. I mean, they're almost like straight A students in, in whatever their field is. Come up and talk to them. And at least one of the winners that I know traditionally has parents and grandparents come. So it's kind of interesting. They will also be eating in the lunchroom with us, but there will be some time between photographs and when we start the presentation that you can come get a little goodie and then talk to them because generally they just kind of sit there and like, oh yeah, mm, yeah, like boring, let's get me out of here. But please stop and congratulate. Find out what they're doing, find out what their education experience is and what they plan to be you now. Uh, last year, one fellow said, oh, I would like to be an extension agent. <laughs> So I know just the person who can come up and say hi to them. So anyway, please stop by if you have a, a minute. It will be before the meeting starts. We would really, the committee and I would really appreciate it. 
And as Denise said, land sale, woo, next year. <laughs> we give it all away. We don't keep a penny of it. So, and if you know what the expenses for college are, this, you know, any coming year, yeah, they really, really appreciate it. So thank you, and please stop by. Stephanie Ballard. just have one thing left and that's a plant steak. <laughs> You're welcome. Pepper Smith. Pepper Smith. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed my little literature and flowers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay, is there any other announcements? Okay, our next regular membership meeting will be on July 18th. So, hope to see you all then. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>